Thank you, Kirsty, and um, good evening, everyone, Vice Chancellor and distinguished guests. This is this is so weird. It's really, yeah, it's amazing, but uh, very weird. Anyway, tonight, <laughs> tonight's going to be broken into six different um, sort of sections that give me a chance to reflect on my journey to being a research scientist, and more importantly, on the people who have helped me along the way um, and carried me and supported me in different ways. Okay, so hopefully if you're still conscious at the end of it, you'll have a better understanding of waterborne disease and of phage or phage. I prefer phage. And why we should all be excited about entering the age of phage as well. Okay, so the darker the blue, the closer we are to the refreshments. Okay, to the beginning. So I grew up in a town called Fleet, which is about 40 miles southwest of London. And I was the youngest addition to an already large family of humans and animals. Um, my three sisters and my brother, I'm, I'm pleased two of my sisters uh, and my niece have made it tonight. Um, but my parents also fostered many children, so our house was also full of um, children who were being looked after as well. So it was, yeah, it was a busy household, and uh, I was really kind of interested in nature and maybe getting out of the house. Um, so there's me with my sister Donna and my mum uh, in Trafalgar Square with some pigeons. There's one of me doing some gardening, looking, looking particularly guilty, I think, in my, uh, my new trainers. I think I've been picking the flowers rather than uh, doing anything else. But I also wanted to be in a band. I really wanted to be in a band, and that's me on the right, you'll see, with the, uh, the denim hot pants and the, uh, the sheepskin, sheepskin waistcoat. Um, but, yeah. So that, that was sort of my childhood. As well as nature, I was also interested in how things worked. Um, I particularly enjoyed making models, assembling things. Um, and you'll see that I already had an excellent taste in quality literature, even at a young age. Uh, that's a field guide to avian dejecta. Um, what bird did that? Um, but it was about this time that my sister, Angela, uh, spent, you're looking worried, spent <laughs> her first wages buying me the joy of knowledge. Um, I'm not sure if she realized there was 50 uh, volumes when she first signed up to it. But uh, I really genuinely loved looking through these kind of... Um, encyclopedias, and realizing that there was a world beyond the, the town that I was growing up in, um, not realizing that I would actually get to, to go to, to many of these places. So um, that, was, that was pretty exciting as well. OK, so that's, these are the early years. And I went to a local comprehensive school called Kelthorpe Park. And uh, that's me, and that's the school. But my life was going to change because I had an incredible teacher, um, somebody who really kind of uh, changed my kind of understanding, my outlook on life, and made me realize that science was for me. And I am absolutely delighted that Mr. Booth is able to be with us here tonight. It's brilliant. I'm kind of humbled. Good, good. And what you probably don't know is I kept my parents... <laughs> now, you're, now you're looking right. But my parents held on to my school report for science. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says, James shows a lively interest in his work and particularly enjoys doing practical experiments. He's therefore making pleasing progress. <laughs> so... Having spent my career doing practical experiments, um, uh, hopefully I'm still making some pleasing progress. But, I, but I, I can't sort of overstate how important it is that that really did change my life. It was one of those moments where I realized that science, science was cool and science was for me. So, buoyed by my kind of pleasing abilities in science, I did something that no one else in my family had done at that point, and that was to head off to university. And I headed south, packed my bags, headed south to study, as we've heard, environmental engineering in Brighton. And that's me looking like, a, I realise I look like a young farmer or something. But it, 
it was about this time that I got interested in water pollution and I got interested in the glamorous world of farm wastes. Um, and there you can see me. But I still wanted to be in a band as well, as you can see from that middle, <laughs> from the middle photo. Um, but that never quite happened, um, mainly because of lack of musical talent. But um, as we've heard, also due to the fact that I crossed paths with uh, a very young lecturer called Hugh Taylor. Um, here he is. And Hugh obviously went on to not just be my lecturer, but to be my uh, colleague, my uh, travel companion, dear friend, uh, supervisor, not in that order. Um, but yeah, so things were changing. Anyone, anyone seen this? This is my favorite exhibit in the Natural History Museum. No? OK. <laughs> Nobody's admitting that they've seen it, if they have. But this is by far the coolest exhibit in the Natural History Museum. You can keep blue whales. You can keep the dinosaurs. <laughs> this is where it's at, because this is really important. It shows what we in the business call the, the fecal oral root, but uh, is otherwise known as the turd to tongue root. <laughs> but joking aside, it's important, because the fecal oral root is reality for um, a large proportion of the, of the world, of two billion people. Um, so it's important, and water can contain a cocktail of harmful microorganisms, of pathogens. And it's important that we are able to understand and detect those. So it's slightly complicated by the fact that different organisms require a different infective dose. So to overcome our immune system, our immune response, we need to ingest, uh, in the case of norovirus, just one or 10, or Giardia or Shigella, can make us ill, one or 10 cells fewer. So that's pretty important. And also, if it's a, a different organism, this is a bacterial organism, Vibrio cholerae, responsible for cholera, then it might be a thousand organisms or even a hundred million organisms to overcome our immune system. Okay, so it's not quite so straightforward. It also depends on our health as well. If we are uh, healthy or if we are immunocompromised, then clearly that has implications. And that can come from malnutrition. But it's not all about us. It's also about the microorganisms because they also need to be uh, in a fit and healthy state to cause infection. So it's, it's highly unlikely that dead, weakened, or damaged pathogens are actually going to make us ill. So when we're testing water, we want to be looking for the infectious organisms, the ones that are actually going to cause us harm. And we've done that for the last 140 years using what we term as fecal indicator organisms. And they're useful. They are shed by everyone in this room, some people more than others. We have a term called super shedders um, that happens. But anyway, so these are fecal coliforms, these organisms. And the, the number of the blue colonies, the blue dots, um, so the greater the number of colonies we have, the greater the probability that we'll encounter some pathogens in our water sample. So it's a, it's a kind of neat way for understanding that water is contaminated with feces, but it doesn't tell us uh, where that is coming from as well. And we express the results in colony forming units per 100 mils. 100 mils is sort of kind of a human mouthful. Um, OK, this has clearly got a lot more colonies on it. It's a bit like the story of the magic porridge pot. There's so many here, they're actually growing out the off the membrane into the, into the Petri dish of agar as well. But um, understanding sources of contamination is really important because it allows us to get a better handle on the risk, and that could be risk to us, to human health, but it can also be risk to the wider environment. So problems of habitat loss or lack of biodiversity that can happen. Um, importantly, it allows us to establish 
responsibility and liability. So we can understand whether it's a water company that's at fault or whether it's actually coming from birds. And most importantly of all, it allows us to target mitigation. It allows us to do something about it. So uh, that's pretty important. So I've spent the last 23 years trying to pull apart the soup of life, trying to separate the human components of contamination from the non-human um, components. And lots of scientists around the world have done it. It even got its own name, microbial source tracking, but has more recently become known as fecal pollution diagnostics. Very catchy, catchy title there. But there are now molecular methods in particular that, which are able to help us to pull apart these particular uh, individual animal types as well. So that's pretty handy. But over the years, loads of methods have been put forward as potential ways of understanding pollution sources. So uh, the human love of caffeine has been used as a marker. Um, Long-chain alkyl benzenes, which are used in detergents, in washing liquids, they've been used. And also the sorts of things that um, I don't use, but fluorescent whitening agents that are used in washing powders as well have been proposed. And ideas of looking at different indicators or different specific organisms, um, and then molecular look at the DNA or the RNA of organisms as well. You can do that. But the method that I chose uh, to look at 20 years ago now focused on patterns of antibiotic resistance. And the method works on the fact that different antibiotics are given to different humans and animals. So antibiotics are used in humans therapeutically and in animals therapeutically, but they're also used uh, prophylactically to prevent disease, particularly in um, mass-produced, uh, intensively reared poultry. And they're also used as growth promoters in livestock to make the animals grow quicker and faster. So these different antibiotics that are used means there are different patterns of antibiotic resistance in bacteria from these different sources. Okay, hopefully it's not too confusing. But what I did was I took a method that was being developed in America and I automated it. I developed a library of known patterns of antibiotic resistance from 2,700 um, organisms, bacteria, and exposed them to 80 different antibiotic concentrations, which created a database of about 215,000 test reactions, which you can see in this well. And when antibiotics, well, when bacteria are resistant to antibiotics, they grow, and you see they, these samples from pigs. This is an antibiotic called tetracycline, that's 64 micrograms per mil. But these organisms have grown, they are resistant, so they have been exposed to antibiotics. And what it allows us to do is to construct a library of patterns of resistance from known sources, known human and animal sources, against which we can test our samples. And it allows us to get an idea of, of where those organisms have come from. So things were going great. Um, I published my first ever paper with Dr. Jessica Wallace, who's here tonight. Um, and I went and gave my first ever presentation to a, a big crowd of people. So things were looking up until, that was, until we started testing samples from other parts of Europe. And what we found was the library was less accurate at predicting correctly the origins of pollution. And something even worse than that was the library was changing overnight or over weeks. It was as though somebody had broken into the library and was rearranging the books um, whilst I was asleep. I was going back in and nothing was working. Um, it, was a, it was a bad time, but it was a useful time because uh, I didn't make myself particularly popular, but I published a paper that stopped this method ever being used again. It stopped other people making that, using the time, effort, energy, and money for other pursuing other techniques. So in that respect, it was very useful. So it was back to the drawing board, and I may not have been stood here tonight um, if it wasn't for doing something scary. And that was going to 
the University of Barcelona to learn some new techniques. So I was lucky to, enough to be working on a framework, European framework project uh, with an unpronounceable uh, name. But it was excellent. It was a really amazing opportunity. And I was taught by professor, professors, Joanne Joffrey, Maite Minessa, and Anaset Blanche, and learned a method that was really going to change, change my world. This coincided with me being given a supercomputer, state-of-the-art technology at the time. Um, you can see how pleased I look with the whole <laughs> setup. But, but what had happened was I'd entered the age of phage. So this method that I was learning was based on these organisms. This is a bacteriophage, as they're better known. And bacteriophages are the most abundant biological entity on our planet. They are the natural enemy of bacteria, and they are found everywhere and anywhere that we find bacteria. So that from the depths of the oceans to the depths of your gut, uh, you'll find bacteriophages. I'll just put them there. Okay, and what they do is, the important thing about them is they are very fussy about which bacteria they like to latch onto and attack. And they do this by landing like a lunar landing module. They then inject their, their molecular material, their DNA or their RNA, into the bacterial cell. They convert that cell into a mini phage factory. So they get busy, and then you get multiple progeny, so multiple copies of themselves being made to such a point that eventually the cell bursts and all these additional phages, 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 um, are then able to go off and infect neighboring cells. And it sets up a chain reaction. So whilst phages themselves are very small, typically sort of 200 times smaller than a bacterial cell, we can actually visualize them with the naked eye by the trail of destruction that they leave behind. So it allows us to really sort of see what's going on. So I, it was time to go fishing. And phages are a bit like um, fine diners at a Michelin-starred restaurant. They are very choosy. Um, the only thing here was this restaurant was Skanes Hill Sewage Treatment Works. <laughs> so I spent some lovely summer afternoons fishing for bacterial hosts that the, the bacteriophage would eat. Um, it was a joyous time, uh, and eventually, after um, a few, few weeks, we eventually found some contenders, some potential uh, bacterial hosts that the phage couldn't get enough of. And the one we found was the, happened to be the 124th one we tested that day, and we called it GB124. So we published the findings, the method for actually capturing the uh, host strains. We then tested it in our local river catchment, the River Ooze. And then we worked with the Health Protection Agency to understand implications for viral, viral waterborne disease control. So it was, um, things, were, things were good. Things were on the up. Um, and we, most importantly, we had this new host that we could use. And this is the method. And the important thing here is there's no library. We don't have to build a library. We can go out and test the samples straight away. And we do that by we grow our host strain. These are called bacteroides, the host that we found at the treat sewage treatment plant. And bacteroides are anaerobic gut microorganisms. So they make up our gut flora and most of our fecal load. Um, anyway, but the, the method is straightforward. You filter, you remove all the debris, you get your phages in the filtered bit, and then you mix it into a semi-solid uh, agar. And then hopefully, if the phages are present, then they eat a hole in your lawn of bacteria. And you can count, just in the same way we counted those colonies of bacteria, we can count these holes, or what we call as plaques. Um, so the method's not only telling us that water's contaminated with human feces, it's telling us how contaminated it is. And that's, that's pretty important. What is also important is the fact that this is a low-cost method. So we're able to do it if we have a lab uh, in a low-cost setting, low-resource setting, we are able to use this method. And that's not the case for a lot of the more expensive molecular-based methods. 
So I, oh yeah, in order to prove that it was ultimately and definitely human specific, I had to go and look for some animals to test, to check it wasn't, uh, these phages weren't present in those. So I, I went from the, the, the fields of Sussex to the interior of Brazil. I came face to face with the world's biggest rodent, the capybara. Um, we tested it, it was all good. Um, and yeah, and cattle. So we had to build this kind of understanding of whether these phages were present or not. And here's some of the clever, more clever stuff. <coughs> Working with talented colleagues, Dr. Leslie Ogilvie and Dr. Brian Jones in particular, we were actually able to start understanding the composition um, of phages within the human gut and to start thinking about the roles that they play. And it further confirmed that the, the host and the phage that we'd got were indeed human specific. So we were able to access databases, molecular or metagenomic databases around the world and confirm this. We were also able to develop new tools to uh, access and to dissect and bring out subliminal information about viruses um, from these databases. So there was some pretty kind of cool stuff coming out of it as well. But our research group have been using phages now for a whole variety of different uses. And these are just six examples of what we've been doing with them. So we've been working with Southeast Water to understand drivers of harmful algal blooms that form on our drinking water reservoirs, trying to understand what's, what's it causing them. Is that human pollution? Is, it coming, is that runoff from agriculture? So that's, that's been useful. We've been working with the Cypriot Ministry of Water Resources to identify unknown, hidden sources of contamination in catchments used for drinking water. Um, during the Olympics, colleagues in our research group also looked at the safety of water, that, recycled sewage that was being used to irrigate the Olympic Park. So that was working with Thames Water. Um, some of our PhD students were looking also at shellfish. So shellfish are interesting because they are bioaccumulators. They are filter feeders. So they bioaccumulate viruses particularly to, to very high levels. And what we were doing again was looking at can we use our human markers, our human phages, to tell us whether we're likely to find norovirus in those samples. Okay, so it's a, a pretty useful technique. And more recently, this is current research that's going on, so Affinity Water are using phages to track groundwater pollution between boreholes. So the transmission of contaminants through people's groundwater sources. Um, we've also worked with Southern Water using phages to understand uh, different water recycling technologies. So I'm spitting, I'm getting, getting too excited. Um, <laughs> I'll calm myself down with a bit of water. Hold on. Uh, so yeah. We've been using lots of different methods. Um, this, is, this isn't all of the applications, but um, I wrote a, an article for a sort of a science magazine about the different applications of phages and, that we were using. It was called something like Contamination Pathways in the Age of Phage. Anyway, it got picked up um, and it ended up putting me in front of a scientific um, parliamentary committee. So Kirsty alluded to this at the beginning. So um, until tonight, this was the, the most terrifying audience uh, I'd faced at that point in my career. Um, so I was pitching on behalf of Applied Microbiology International, who had put forward an idea, um, and then they needed somebody to present it. And I thought about it for a, about 20 minutes, and then I thought of something that Hugh had told me ages ago, is saying that it was important to do something scary every week. Um, so I, I ignored him most of the time, but occasionally I thought, no, I'll, this time I will do it. So I did something scary um, and said yes. So the, the pitch was about uh, barriers to the use of phages for therapeutic um, treatments in the UK. So even at this point, I was still not really convinced. You can see the phages in action again. 
Um, but to my delight and uh, relief, um, our pitch was uh, selected as the, the winning pitch and is now a uh, current inquiry which is taking evidence. So the, the, the inquiry has been taking written evidence and then inviting experts in the field of phage therapy from national level to international level, inviting them to Parliament to, to uh, basically to provide evidence. And the, they've been meeting today, actually. They met earlier today, taking further evidence. So it's going to be really exciting to see what comes out of this. And I'd like to show you a short film that the Science and Technology Committee uh, released to coincide with the launch of the inquiry. So I'm pretty excited by it. Sounds good. Okay, um, so yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of the inquiry and how that translates into policy, more importantly, and change on the ground. And that's what we really want to see with this. So um, I think it's a case of watch this space. You can see updates on the inquiry which are taking place regularly. But I want us to move back from the world of therapeutic uh, use of phages to uh, a different, more environmental use. Um, and I want to give you a flavour of some of the projects that we've been working on and why microbes, although we often tend to, they tend to get a bad press, microbes really can be a force for good. They can really improve our uh, understanding of disease pathways, of particular health risks, and to really sort of open our open our eyes to, to what's going on. So they can be used in, in, in very interesting ways, and which um, I have made a short film which goes from uh, very kind of um, densely populated slum areas in India where you've got people living in close proximity to, proximity to one another. And then we move to uh, another more recent project which is currently running where we're looking at uh, rapidly growing towns and some of the challenges uh, that, uh, that take place there. And then we move on to another project, uh, which I'll talk about, which is emergency settings, what we do during humanitarian crisis as well. So um, sit back and relax. There's another video which I kind of put together. Um, apologies for my bad camera work.
Okay, so hopefully that's given you a, a bit more of a feel for what some of these situations are like on the ground and some of the challenges um, that are confronting people in their everyday lives. And the film really chiefly focused on this project, um, which was working with the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases in Kolkata and was led by Emory University in the States, Professor Christine Moe. And we were called into this project to, to help because looking for the, the actual pathogen, the, the salmonella, typhi or paratyphi, is extremely expensive, it's complicated, um, and yeah, it's, it's very difficult to do. And by looking at human-specific phages, it's able, you're able to find the sort of smoking guns. You're able to find where um, the exposure pathways, where those pathways of pollution are likely to be as well. So that's what we were sort of brought into the project to do, to basically kind of understand risk and most importantly to prioritise sanitation investment based on based on exposures that were really happening to people, why, why certain people were getting ill, uh, and why in existing interventions weren't actually helping. They weren't reducing the incidence of disease. Um, and what we, what we found um, among the many different pathways of transmission or exp exposure was that human fecal uh, exposure was also happening through uh, fre fresh produce, so probably produce that had been irrigated uh, with wastewater, but also we were finding it in street food. Um, street food that's been cooked, um, but we were finding it in things like the dips, tamarind dips and other parts of food. So it could, it's probably in the food handling, the food preparation uh, stages that those sorts of um, exposures were happening as well. So it was able to give us a sort of insight into what was, what was happening. And then there was the Brown Gold Project, which is being expertly run by Professor Lila Mehta, who's in the room, and colleagues at IDS. And this has been a very challenging project in terms of a project that took place during the pandemic. But we finally got to all meet each other. Um, and this was, this was in, uh, in Kerala, in India, just before Christmas, where we finally got to work with these amazing partners. And we're, this project's focus focusing on five growing towns in Ethiopia, in Ghana, in India, and Nepal. And it's trying to understand um, some of the problems around the sanitation chain, this is what we call this, um, from where waste is produced to where it hopefully can be reused and recycled. So wastewater is a really important source of water, but even more so it's an important source of nutrients that can be harnessed to feed growing populations, particularly in urban centres as well. So this needs to be done in a safe way that doesn't introduce new risks um, to communities. And, and what we've been trying to do is elucidate some of these pathways um, of contamination that are going on in the ground. And we've been focusing particularly on Nepal. And I know Lila's heading out to Nepal later this week, very soon, in fact. Um, but projects, whenever we apply for funding, we always tell people our projects are interdisciplinary. And this project really genuinely is interdisciplinary. Um, you heard about the different groups of people working together. So this project brings together social scientists, it brings together natural scientists, it brings together um, artists. Um, we're working with sanitation workers, with different community groups as well. And it's, so it's about bringing together and working across divides, but it's also about working across continents and seeing some of the similarities that are emerging from all these different towns that we're focusing on as well. So it's been and still is a really exciting, interesting project. There's been lots of challenges along the way. Um, we've learned a lot. But it's about co the co-production of knowledge working with communities, um, helping to disseminate information that we're generating together with the partners as well. So it's been, it's been a really uh, enjoyable um, project and we look forward to some of the outcomes and outputs and 
Importantly, we're trying to inform policy. We're trying to change the situation on the ground, the reality for people, the reality for those people who uh, are affected by faecal contamination, by the faecal oral route that I mentioned. Finally, um, this project, um, this project nearly never happened because the government cut overseas development aid funding. Um, so we lost the funding to this project just as it was about to start. And a year and a half later, I'm very pleased um, that this project started about two months ago. And this project is, is different in that we're trying to understand what happens in the immediate aftermath of a humanitarian uh, disaster. That could be a disaster caused by earthquakes. It could be uh, human conflicts. But when you start having large populations of humans doing what humans do, um, you need to be able to treat the waste very effectively and very quickly to shut down any potential uh, outbreaks of diseases, dysentery, cholera, um, typhoid, there's plenty of them, diarrheal disease. So this project is allowing us to do that in a smarter way. Um, it's focused on the Rohingya refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. This is the world's largest uh, refugee camp. It's currently home to a million Rohingya who've been escaping violence um, that's been taking place in Myanmar. So we're going to be focusing on two faecal sludge treatment plants. And my colleague, Dr. Diogo, who's in the room, Diogo Trajano Gomez de Silva, um, but this project really does build on previous research. Like most research does, it's incremental. But this research has its basis in work that uh, Professor Hugh Taylor was doing originally in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010 and the subsequent cholera outbreak that took place there. Um, Professor, um, oops, I've, gone, I've drawn a blank, uh, Tom Curtis. I'm always going to say Tony Curtis, but Tom <laughs> Curtis. <laughs> Uh, at Newcastle, sorry Tom, um, who was also instrumental in the, the early part of this work. But then we had a PhD student who is now Dr. Emanuele Sozzi, who was working for Medicines Sans Frontières um, with an excellent uh, colleague called Je Jeff Fesselet. And this was about trying what was, what was possible on the ground in terms of setting up labs to try and understand how well the methods worked. So this work has been advanced by Dr. Diogo, who I just mentioned, and another former colleague, uh, Dr. Edgar Diaz. And they were optimizing the methods. And what we're doing with this new project is, is actually implementing those optimized approaches so that MSF can use these methods around the world um, safely and cost-effectively. OK, so that's probably enough about the actual um, the research projects, but I called my presentation Humans, Health and Hope. And it really is about the humans, not just the humans at the receiving end of poor water and sanitation, but also the amazing humans um, that I've had the pleasure to, to work with, to supervise, uh, to be kind of working together addressing some of these, these issues as well. So we're generally a happy bunch, I think. There's quite a few of these individuals in the room tonight, I can see. But I've supervised 13 PhD students from eight countries over the last 16 years. And it's one of the elements of my job, my role at the university that I most enjoy, or most of the time most enjoy. <laughs> Um, but, and what is really exciting is to see what people have gone on to do. And all of these students have forged careers um, in the water industry, effectively, um, working in different parts of the world. Um, Carolina got her PhD just to this afternoon. It was finally confirmed. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Carolina's now working uh, at a, another research institute just down the coast from us. Um, but we've got academics. We've got uh, sanitary engineers. We've got uh, research managers. 
We've got a principal consultant in the water industry, Austin. Um, so, yeah, it's, it is amazing that they've all gone on to um, forge careers in this, in this way. And it's really genuinely uh, very exciting to see that. And I think the, the future is in safe hands with these folks in charge. So I've just, I couldn't help myself. I have to go back <laughs> to this image. Um, because the reason this is so important is it illustrates the multi-barrier approach. And this is the approach that we take. And in all of those projects that I discussed, mentioned, it's, this is ultimately what we're trying to do. This is, whether it's drinking water, okay, it's, this is a different transmission method, but it's about breaking the fecal oral route. It's about removing the number twos from H2O. Okay. So I would like to conclude by dedicating this lecture to my amazing parents, uh, Molly and John, and to my late great mate, Hugh. And I am incredibly grateful to the guidance that I've received throughout my career from my, uh, my family, from my German family, my partner Anka, from my dear friends, so many of you kind of in here tonight. Um, it's been amazing. And from the guidance and encouragement from my science teacher um, through to the support I've had from colleagues the mentorship that I've had, particularly as an early career researcher, um, has been amazing. That's been really genuinely um, incredible. And I've also had the pleasure, good fortune, to work with so many amazing project partners, collaborators around the world, and to the other people who've supported this research to make it happen, the technicians, the support staff, who've actually allowed us to do what we do. Um, so I am immensely grateful. I'm getting slightly emotional, Gwyneth Paltrow moment. Um, <laughs> but I would like to leave you with a quote from uh, Heraclitus, from Greek philosopher, and then I would also like to hand you over to our Vice-Chancellor, I believe, who is going to conclude proceedings. <laughs>